And welcome, you're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Just think, the weather is upon us to where we'll be able to stretch out and enjoy ourselves out in nature and be able to discover a whole new us. But how many of us are actually going to pitch tents and just sit around the campfire and see how much beer we can drink and how much barbecue we can eat and how many stories we can tell? Are we really going to stretch out and connect in this nature that we want to find that can be so refreshing and spiritually enlightening and lifting by the time we're finished? Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is someone with a particular place known simply as Trackers Northwest in which we begin to value what we experience in nature by special skills that maybe many of us don't have, such as being able to track wild animals. How about being able to build a fire without your big lighter? And mostly maybe being able to carve out a stone knife so that way that you've got a handy tool available while you're by the campfire. I'd like to welcome to the program the founder, Tony Dees, of Trackers Northwest. And Tony, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. Great to be here. You bet. Now, how did you get started with all this? What was your interest uh, in the outdoors? Is this something that you've always had? Well, in a way, yes. Way, way back in the day when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in the suburbs of Milwaukee here in Portland, and we did have a big backyard, so it was the garden that actually got me started. Uh, the garden that was a little bit wild and woolly, but at the same time, it actually fed our family, and uh you know, that's a rare thing even back then, uh, and especially the rare thing nowadays. And the more and more I spent time just out there, I realized that nature was where it was at for me, that I felt more at home there. I felt more at home outside and more real. And, you know, uh, like any kid growing up, uh, you, you contrast that with school and with all the things that you have to do day to day that seem more ab- too abstract. Now, when you started uh, Trackers Northwest, what was your mission? Well, um, it's based on a simple premise. Common sense is no longer common. Uh, Is that the the truth? (laughs) Yeah, it's completely the truth. We see kids and adults, because we work with both, that are coming to us not because they lack common sense, but they actually lack the opportunity to apply and use it and test it. It's a muscle that you've got to flex. So we just give them that opportunity to rediscover that wisdom that comes with connection to the land. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the skills that you uh, like to teach people at Trackers Northwest and what the format is is that people decide, you know, maybe you're right, I want to be able to really enjoy nature in a way that I never did before. So what is it that people can expect when they go to Trackers Northwest? Well, they can actually expect a lot of things. It's an eclectic range of skills. It's really easy to focus on the primitive skills. Those have the most sex appeal, so to speak. Making that stone knife, making that fire without matches, sleeping out in debris shelter. But we also range also to uh, sustainabil- sustainability, like permaculture, organic gardening, folk craft. Uh, you know, we have a class coming up where we make a ninth century German shoe that's really highly functional and very comfortable out in the real world, quote unquote, in the modern world. Uh, and so they can expect a very broad ranging uh, field of skills, although they are all connected by the fact that they're more locally based or locally sustained. And even deeper than that, they can expect a uh, awareness of a village of people that are living in connection to their land. So we really highly value family. We prize the uh, ideal of people working together and making a livelihood together in a way where it's all about good food and good friends and uh, surrounding yourself with, uh, with the bounty of the land. Now, here's something interesting. You just picture, for instance, a typical family that goes camping, and they make sure that the ice box is full of the food that they want to enjoy uh, while they're out camping for a period of time. When they uh, take courses in Trackers Northwest, is this something where maybe they can kind of pull away from the ice box a little bit? Yeah, and of course I suggest a balance. Sure. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a graduation to uh, full local foods living. Uh, I, the first thing I suggest is maybe go take a wild edible plants course, and then you can go out and part of your camping trip, in fact, the fat focus of your camping trip could be going and collecting chanterelle mushrooms, 
Can we collect a nettle, which is fabulous. It's an amazing replacement for spinach. In fact, it tastes a heck of a lot better. Uh, we take my grandma's old uh, spinach recipe, spinach for tuline, which is fried spinach patties, and we use nettle instead. So that's the graduation that you can have towards it. And you'll begin to realize less and less, especially if you know your place very well, that you need, you, you need that ice box full of food less and the, the foods that you have with you, the supplies, the, the things that tend to your needs are things that can come from a local level and have a great deal of artisan quality behind it. Oh, that just sounds almost romantic in its own right, that's for sure. <laughs> that's the goal. That's the other thing we're missing is adventure in life, mm -hmm. and uh, we want to put that back in. Well, you know, and the reason I brought that up, and, and you say it's it's interesting when you learn to hunt for wild food, as you say, is because of the fact that, it, it as you said, it puts the adventure back in. And I can remember it was many years ago I was out camping uh, with a girlfriend of mine, and she was just sitting there, through the course of the day, saying to herself, geez, I wish we had more friends here. I feel kind of bored. And I'm thinking, are you out of your mind? There's a lot we could be doing here, like hiking, for instance. But, you know, maybe she hit on a key point that she just didn't know outside of the campfire and, of course, partying and hanging out with friends. What else should we be doing out there? And I would, I would see the adventure of, for instance, going on the wild food hunt, how that would make the day very interesting. Yeah, in fact, it defines how we're connected to the land. We have There's a term out there in the wilderness or outdoor education field called sense of place, where you, you have the sensibility of what is around in your place. And we want to actually go beyond that. People will have no desire to take care of the land around them unless there's a functional connection to it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. we're, we're inherently pragmatic. Uh, uh, people are. Um, living beings are. So if we, uh, if we honor that pragmatism, then we will enjoy ourselves. We will want to be there more. Uh, you know, you end up going to work because you get a paycheck. If you go outside because you get fed, you'll go outside more. Mm, very good. Well said. Now, let's talk about some of the other traditional skills that you like to uh, also teach. Uh, you talked about, for instance, the ability to make fire without, you know, with the uh, things that you have around you. That sounds pretty intriguing. Yeah, it's a pretty actually simple process. It's basically uh, friction. And, you know, a lot of people will pull out their Bic lighter when you're trying to demonstrate this, and they think they're being funny, but then they realize, wait a minute, you just did that in 20 seconds. Oh, and really? That's oh, wow. That took me. Yeah. <laughs> and honestly, I could, get, I could get people up to that level within a month. Uh, it, you know, it took me a while to figure it out because I didn't have the level of teachers that we have now or that we've cultivated. But it's, there's a certain, like I said, uh, art to it. There's, there's a romantic quality to it that is very eloquent and very smooth. Uh, and there's a lot of methods for building fire by friction. There's a bojo, you might have seen it, where uh, the spin, there's a spindle wrapped in the bow and the, it rubs against a base fireboard. There's also the hand drill method where you're actually drilling that spindle with your hands. Uh, fire saw, which is you know, better for tropical woods. And so there's many ways to do it. There's as many ways to start a fire as there probably is people on this earth. And so I think that I think that that's the eloquence of it, that one of our most primal resources can be not only just a matter of survival, but a matter of art. Mm, very good. I'm reminded of the movie Quest for Fire, where they were actually mm -hmm. able to carry the fire around in a little firebox and preserve exactly. it, and they just continually were, were being able to make uh, little fires wherever they needed to go. You know, and it's really interesting, and I think that when kids get an opportunity to experience this, because... The one thing that you see really dying on the fringes are summer camps, and hopefully yep. we get the opportunity to see those revived because I remember how valuable it was for me as a kid to experience those things because, you know, here you have this big green movement, but the fact is is you don't have enough out there that allows people to stretch in to see the importance of mm -hmm. what it is to have sustainable practices. Absolutely, and... With our camps and with any programs that we do, especially for adults, we really try to bring skills back that are no that that were at one at, at one point everyone knew, and you know nowadays they're lost. And too many camps at this point are simply babysitting for kids. Right. They're simply you know keeping them in a room or keeping them contained. And while it is about keeping them safe and happy and healthy, it's also about bringing a level of understanding to the world that they wouldn't normally get. And this isn't school, again. Mm -hmm. This isn't a repeat. You know, they don't leave in June just to start again, you know, uh, 
within a week for summer camp. This is actually real uh, get your hands dirty, carve wood with a knife, um, shoot bows and arrows, something that summer camps are letting slip away. And I, you know, the same thing could apply for adults too. Mm, I'll tell you, it sounds like a really good time now. Uh, how about animal tracking? I know that that was one of the things that you cover in your course, and I found that intriguing because you're kind of going on the hunt, but it isn't so much that you want to go out and destroy the animal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's also people think about tracking, they think about footprints and, well, animal poop, basically, you know, right. following all the signs, and those are the most overt and obvious signs. And animal tracking is that and more. We don't, we don't just want people following tracks in the mud. What we want to do is have them think about it like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. Mm. If you ever read a Sherlock Holmes book, he's dealing with so many details, and he's rapidly integrating them into a larger story. Animal tracking is really just dynamic thinking um, squared. It's, it, it's systems thinking and awareness, hypersensory awareness. I see people, I know people, um, in fact, I can take in the woods and find tracks on surfaces where you never thought you would see them. Uh, it's, it's following a bear through the bird alarms in the forest because the alarms are upset due to the fact that that large predator, the birds are upset due to the fact that that large predator is moving through the woods. So it's taking all these details that have been pulled in by really attuned senses and being able to synthesize them very, very, very quickly because everything's changing out in the woods. You can never have a static answer for anything. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because it also begins to, I guess, exercise something that a lot of us tend to lose, especially with today's technology, is intuition. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And actually, you begin to see that there's nothing magical or mystical about intuition. It's actually a very pragmatic skill. It's uh, just people thinking on an extremely creative level. And uh, I've seen great results develop really quickly with people. Uh, that's uh, that just sounds like such a good time. That's for sure. Now you also talk about things such as village skills. Let's talk about what those are. Village skills is our word for how do people work together really, really well. Uh, we've all been involved in organization or worked for a company where the dynamics are just weird and strange and odd and actually very dysfunctional. Uh, so the village. You got that right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how often have you been been in, been involved in a group where everyone wants consensus and they're going right. to all oh, they're all supposed to agree? But meanwhile, that that very useful idea is often abused. And village skills are how does it actually work so we can make our life and livelihood? We can make a living and work together. We can butcher that buffalo. We can even, you know, um, uh, address our financial portfolio. All these things so that we actually have more time to attribute to the family. We have more time to sit down and eat good food together. It's the most efficient way of working together. Our organization is even organized on these principles where, you know, they're short meetings, they're very they're frequent and they're iterative and it's based on the autonomy of the individual. Um, it's based on building faith and trust in the people you work with to such a high capacity that you're just a well-oiled machine. And the, those principles are actually drawn from uh, old ways of interacting with each other, both as a family and a village. Oh, that's the, it's wonderful because it's, you know, one of those things that kind of fade. You know, as you said, there's no uh, common sense, it seems, anymore. Or the common mm -hmm. and the sense just don't seem to be around anymore. And it's just it's interesting how something such as this can bring all that back. Oh, absolutely. You know, in fact, it's, it naturally comes back when you let people do what people naturally do. That's mm -hmm. it. I, I mean, it, I'm shocked time and time and again, I shouldn't be shocked at this point, how quickly people recover a highly functional way of working and living and playing together. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, as you bring, let's say, children or even some young adults, and these could be kids that in a typical environment such as going to school every day, they tend to just kind of become troubled and get in trouble. Do you see something like this as an opportunity where they can stretch out a little bit and that might kind of calm down? Yeah, remarkably so, especially in, other words, in the it's, it's an interesting way of calling it natural self-discipline, I guess. 
It is. Actually, we rely on kids to um, often suss out their own needs. And although we give them ample space for it, we give them ample support and feedback. But you know, we consider a kid when they're uh, past in their early teens, we consider them ready to start to understand what it means to be an adult. In fact, we know that they're craving for it. So when you trust them with a high degree of responsibility and accountability for each other as peers or as a team, then they typically come through. Uh, some instances you require more depth uh, awareness than others uh, based on you know, what challenges they might have in their past history. But as a whole, uh, people are, just do a very good job of building trust and faith and rising to the occasion when you give them the real opportunity. Uh, but you've got to make sure that you're actually giving them the opportunity. Oftentimes we think we are, and uh, really there's still these seeds or uh, systems of mistrust inlaid in what we're working with. Mm -hmm. Well, that goes hand in hand. Like, for instance, I've seen in places that I've worked where somebody is assigned to train somebody to do a job, mm -hmm. and it seems the trainer is interfering in that, giving the person the time and the space to actually begin to get what they were supposed to do, so they exactly. become frustrated or they be, you know they do a half job or whatever the case is and i i would always suggest you know your job is to be a shadow and back off and then guide them into the process and let them feel the confidence themselves and that's certainly what you do here with trackers northwest yeah that's the goal good leaders ask honest questions that's that's basically it and uh collaboration with our students is the key so we actually try to remove the instructor student uh, uh, dynamic and pull it more into the fact that you're an intelligent person and we don't need to make you better with us. We actually need to make better systems so that people um, feel more confident and healthy. Oh, very well said. I certainly appreciate that you said that, Tony. Now, let's talk about uh, how Trackers Northwest works. Is this a summer camp or do you have certain classes? How does, how does everything work here? Absolutely year-round. Uh, we have summer camps for kids. We also have homeschool programs and after-school programs for them. For adults, we have weekend programs where you can do the varying skills. We have one coming up uh, that's all for women, another coming up where they actually butcher a buffalo and learn to make sausage from it uh, at home. Uh, we have full-week programs such as the Nature of the Village where all of the skills we talk about are practiced and uh, along with the fact that we come together and we work for a week to recreate a working living village. Uh, these are for adult, that's for a family and adults and kids. And we also have a full-time adult program that happens over a period of nine months, and we're also going to restructure that so that people can take it for three-month stints. And in that, you can build your own kayak, uh, get your permaculture design certification, and uh, just learn and experience a deeper connection with the land throughout all the seasons. You know, the most important thing about that, too, Tony, is I know that we're going to be having a segment coming up here in the near future, and that is about being able to survive uh, during emergency times. And you think of things mm -hmm. such as 9-11, for instance, or you think of the hurricane in, in New Orleans. And, for instance, here we're kind of distanced to the kind of chaos an event like that can create to the point that, if we were involved in it, would we really be prepared, so to speak? And I could see how something like Trackers Northwest can really put that special intuition and that common sense into you during those kinds of times, not that we ever hope that they happen again, but should they happen, that you'll feel confident and equipped with the skills that you'll have to be able to work your way through something like that. Exactly. In fact, it's kind of like surfing, actually. And whether the crisis be large or be great or small, crisis also builds community. And uh, if, if you frame it in the right way, if you assume the right stance when it actually happens, and that's our goal is to ready people to do that. When a crisis does happen, uh, it's not just about fixing it, fixing it, but it's featuring how it brings us together. Mm, very good. Now, what are some of the other skills that you also teach that people find very intriguing? Hmm. Uh, well, people are always fascinated with... Because buffalo sausage sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah, actually, that th those kind of things really hit home, especially in the urban environment. I'm, I'm actually shocked how quickly uh, butchering and dressing classes and uh, programs about homesteading-based skills really do well. Uh, they, 
I, I, what I think it is is it's, it's not just an issue of people wanting to get back to the land, but it's also an issue of people wanting to have a sense of eloquence with mm -hmm. what they do and, what, and how they live. And so those artisan classes you know, serve us pretty darn well. We also do natural building programs. Uh, we have a program that's uh, urban tracking where you actually go in the middle of the city and you start to piece things together from that more detective perspective. If you see that cigarette butt on the ground, was it, you know, was the person smoking it male or female? Were they standing? Were they sitting? Were they, what were they doing? Where did they come from? Where did they get that pack of cigarettes? What was oh. their daily routine? You know, asking all those questions to be able to piece it together. So the gamut is pretty broad, but again, they're all tied by the fact that common sense is no longer common. But if we give people a chance to do these great things and have great adventures, they will rise to the occasion. Well, it's certainly one thing is true that you're saying there, Tony, is that you put the mystery and the adventure back into life, even in the urban dwelling as you're talking about, and you realize just how often most of us, especially in this day and age of technology, tend to live on autopilot. Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing that we want to address while at the same time not deriding, you know, because people right. people's lives can't change that dramatically. I mean, they, they can, but uh, that's not necessarily the only way to do it. People can take it in incremental steps, and you can give them good reasons for uh, not only getting out by themselves, but getting out with their family and their friends and um, finding fidelity. Now, Tony, tell me, through the time that you've been doing or involved in Trackers Northwest, what have been what you would consider to be really amazing transformational stories with individuals that have been through the program? Oh, that's a fantastic question. You know, I have had moments when students that I've only encountered for like 15, 20 minutes, because the ideas that we express are so innate and so natural, um, I end up running into them years later, and they remember me, and they say, you changed my life. And I was like, what? How's that possible? And you know, right. I actually, in hindsight, I'm really like, I didn't actually change their life. I, you know, I just uh, did something that was normal and healthy and natural, and people rise to that occasion. Uh, one of the greatest moments I did have was with a group of high school students that we worked with in the Portland Waldorf School. We were running a week-long program for their class. We would actually worked with these kids for a couple years. And we excel at giving them autonomy, trusting their competency to come out. And the goal of this camp, this program for a week in April, was to build a 30-person traditional skin-on-frame whaling boat called an umiak. And obviously, they weren't going to take it whaling. They also were going to weave their own crab pots and go crabbing, collect their own mussels, um, cook their own food on an 80-acre permaculture garden down in Port Orford. They were you know, by the ocean building this boat, harvesting. Uh, working on permaculture projects, fixing a cob oven, cooking pizza in a cob oven, just you know, milking goats. And the entire camp was at the moment, based on these principles that we use called agile team development, uh, run by the kids as they were there, run by the teenagers, the young adults. And the synthesis was incredible. The history that we had put with them clearly showed. And also at the same time, the 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 proof and the pudding that they that teenagers can work together competently can you know they they build a whaling boat in five days and they plan the schedule entirely on their own wow. and uh, and every time a challenge came up they dealt with it iteratively they addressed it immediately and that it wasn't about everybody raising their hand and forming consensus it was about more more not a consensus vote but a consensus polling about what everybody felt as individuals was the best thing to do, and building trust that people were going to make the intelligent decisions. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that that worked so well, in fact, it got better and better as the weeks went on, and we proved that it, there was, it was actually going to be better if the kids had control versus the instructors had control or the young adults had control, uh, then I was happy to see that. I was greatly, great, I was very proud of it. You know, Tony, here's a broad stroke for you, too, as well, because you brought up something that's very important, uh, and that is about our teens. And, and we all remember what it was like to be a teenager and try to assert our individualism and our ability to be independent and make good decisions, but there was always some adult somewhere that was always saying, what do you know, you're just a kid. And the thing is, is as we've seen, actually now it's encouraging to see that there's a decreased rate of 
of teenagers dropping out of high school. But what do you think is going on there, say, within the school system that could be revamped to where I suppose that there is more participation? It seems to me the one key thing you hit on there is that leaders need to allow people to make you know personal decisions and, and good decisions that are part of a whole as you do in Trackers Northwest. Is that probably an area that maybe uh, schools can explore? Yeah, it could be definitely expanded upon, albeit even that is going to fail unless you give teenagers something real to do. Right. Uh, they're craving. They're looking for a rite of passage, and a rite of passage isn't defined as I'm going to get out the other end as a better person. A rite of passage is actually defined as I'm going to find my vision, my individual gift, that can really give back to my community. A lot of people have individual talents and gifts, but defining how it can help your community and especially your family is as old as time itself. And we give our teenagers too much busy work and not enough work that actually in reality contributes back to their family. Even uh, projects that I see done in school, project-based learning, experiential-based learning, are all still in the end the results are abstracted or they're allowed to be mediocre and we need more real world stuff. What food am I bringing home to my family and literally putting in the freezer? Um, what clothes are we selling for them? What houses are we building? What money are we actually returning? Uh, teens are very entrepreneurial in their awareness. They actually can uh, pick up on those skills very quickly and uh, be more deft at it than people realize. So that's well, the rite of passage that we need to find for them. That's the other thing, too, about teens is they are so tremendously, A, willing to be participatory and, and involved, and at the same time, they're extremely resilient. You know, they haven't yep. really been beat up as much as adults, you know, to where they can't believe anything anymore. And I say, you know, if, uh, for instance, I was even talking even with my own daughter, and I said, you have the ability now to start your own business. And she's thinking to herself, but I'm just a freshman That's in high awesome. school. I said, yeah, but yep. you still have a good idea. You still have the ability. What would you like to do? And really put them to that test so they can see themselves succeeding. Because I thought to myself, how would you like to retire by the time you're in your 20s or 30s and actually really go do a lot of neat things? And the fact is, is that we, as you said, that rite of passage is so unavailable that they get to a point in their adulthood that the conditioning has allowed them to believe that they can't do things. Oh, absolutely, exactly. In fact, we stave off that ability to contribute to our family and our community, you know, all the way into uh, our mid-30s or even right. further on. And so then it prevents wisdom from accruing early on, which is the, the true test, the true need of older adults is uh, to sit back and say, hey, you know, now you're going to be get really busy. Now you're going to start to contribute to the family and community. You're going to feel all of these things are important, but at, as a whole, it's about loving and caring about each other. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, as you get older and become an you know older adult, you get you should have that opportunity to work less and um, talk about how much we can just slow down and care about one another. And we don't get that because we stave off uh, the rite of passage from our teens to the mid-30s. So certainly, Tony, what you're saying is this is an opportunity that we can begin to slow down and smell the roses. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, and it's like, it's like it should happen earlier and earlier and earlier. And, and, and unfortunately, in our culture, it ends up happening later and later and later. And uh, I think that through that, then we accrue more wisdom that right. uh, can, can truly, I mean, at, at the heart of it, the the young people, pe people, younger people, young adults, are looking for adults to um, show them that life can be deft and interesting and relevant. Uh, they don't need uh, unsolicited advice. What they need is um, beautiful examples of living. That's it. Exactly. I totally agree with that. I mean, it seems today every adult comes after a teen, and they've got advice, they've got a lecture or something. <laughs> and, you know, at least with my own children, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I did what my mother did with me, and I would just share stories with them. Exactly. You know, and it could be about somebody else. It could have been about me. You know, it didn't matter, but it was a story. And then that way I could walk away and let them draw their own conclusions in their own way. And to give you a funny example, 
there was a time when my daughter, she was, I think, in the third grade, and all of a sudden I'd heard this news bulletin that somebody was driving around using a, 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 a lure, if you will, to lure young kids uh, into his truck by simply saying, I've lost my dog, and, and uh, you know, and could you please help me find him? Of course, a little kid's going to want to cooperate. Mm-hmm. And so I simply turned the story around instead of, you know, in the news, this is this, I just simply said, you know, I heard from a friend of mine, and I laid out the scenario of what had happened according to the news. And yep. so my daughter said, you know, it was interesting because a couple of days after I told her that, somebody had stopped by in a car and said, you know, I, I've lost this cat. It looks like this. Could you help me find him? And she says, no, I've got something else I've got to go do. <laughs> Brilliant. You know, and arming our kids with the ability to set healthy boundaries right. uh, with one another uh, is, is really critical. In fact, arming them with self-defense skills. Mm-hmm. Uh, is a common sense skill that's no longer common. You know, we don't we don't have to teach our kids to be uh, completely trusting of everything. In fact, actually, that's not a healthy thing to do. No, I mean, you wouldn't trust that you can be out in nature and go up and hug a grizzly bear just because it's <laughs> <he was> cute. <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I think that our, our, I mean, if you look back on you know way way back in the day. There were kids that, uh, you know, they'd wander miles and miles away from home, and they'd stay safe and happy and healthy. Uh, This is a gift that we can give back to them. Again, kids have more ability to be competent and resilient than we give them credit for. In fact, there's actually a movement out there called Free Range Kids. uh, Oh, Free Range Kids. I like that. (laughs) Quite a following, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, Tony, tell people uh, uh, through this program how they can find out more about Trackers Northwest and if... There are other type communities throughout the United States that are pretty much doing what you're doing as well. Well, there's actually quite a few uh, communities throughout the United States that are doing what we're doing. And, uh, you know, there's plenty in the East Coast. There's actually a lot in Vermont. There's uh, one in Washington called Wilderness Awareness School. Uh, If you want to find out more about Trackers Northwest, go to www.trackersnw.com. Or for our full-time adult programs, go to Trackers Teams, as in like a soccer team. dot mm-hmm. com. Trackers Teams. dot com, and that'll tell you a little bit more about all of our programs. We have uh, programs in the Bay Area and San Francisco. We have programs in Bend. We have programs in Portland, and we have uh, Trackers coming up, popping up all around the country, actually. Uh, but it all started in Portland, so it's all Willamette Valley original, definitely. Well, leave it to the Northwest to always be the trailblazer of all the things that are happening positive in the world today when it comes to connecting with nature and a true Absolutely. green movement. <laughs> well, Tony I'm Dice, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Tony Dice, for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Go ahead and give your website out again one more time. Uh, www.trackers, T-R-A-C-K-E-R-S-N-W.com, trackersnorthwest.com. And I'll look forward to getting out there and hugging that grizzly bear. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, that's a rite of passage, too. You bet. Take care, Tony. It's been a pleasure to have you on the program. Thanks a lot. Great being here. Bye. You bet. So there you go. That's the opportunity for you to stretch out and enjoy nature in a way that you probably could never have thought of before. Trackers Northwest could be the gateway to a whole new sense of mystery being opened up and adventure being enjoyed. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Also be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter where we post events such as Trackers Northwest for you to be able to find out more about how you can get involved. We also welcome your questions or comments about the radio program. Just simply send me an email to daniel at beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis, and remember, live your day past halfway.